discovernewport.org. I'm Tori Bedford. Tonight on Greater Boston, the governor's budget proposal would cut state HIV and infectious disease resources. A local advocate and an infectious disease doctor join me on what this will mean for patients. Plus, is the T working better after months of repairs? After even more derailments and disruptions, it's complicated. GBH's transportation reporter joins to discuss. Doctors, advocates, and people living with HIV and AIDS are pushing back against a planned $5.6 million cut to resources in the state budget. The nonprofit Victory Programs and Project ABLE, a coalition of AIDS service providers and organizers, marched to the State House a few days back to urge lawmakers to reject the cuts included in Governor Maura Healey's proposed budget. Carla Norris, the director of client services for AIDS Project Worcester, was at the State House rally and day of advocacy. She joins me now along with Dr. Sabrina. Sabrina Asumu, an infectious disease physician who specializes in HIV AIDS at Boston Medical Center and has done research work with Victory Programs. Thank you both so much for being here. So when we talk about this line item, right, I mean, this is HIV infectious diseases and harm reduction. What does this funding currently go towards, Sabrina? You yeah, know, this is very important funding that not only funds the public health workforce, these are the people who are meeting people where they are and providing support and services. It also funds testing, which is, as we know, is a pivotal and important pillar to making sure that we identify who's infected with HIV so that we can link them to care, but also identify those who do not have HIV, but who may be at risk and also provide preventive services. Right, and so all of these programs throughout the state have been kind of moving forward. Um, what do you think the impact would be of, of this? reduction. No, I think that even thinking about coming off the pandemic, where we've seen less testing and less identification of cases, it is key that we maintain and even um, supplement the current funding that we have so that we can continue to support the community and also provide those vital services. And Carla, with your work on the ground, I mean, what would that, what would the impact look like? What is the current scope of the need? I definitely think the impact and the scope of the work that we do, these dollars provide financial assistance to pay for HIV treatment. So we know treatment as prevention today, U equals U, meaning undetected. When someone is on treatment and they have been virally suppressed for an extended period of time, at least six months or more, that means undetected equals untransmittable. And when someone is undetected, that means they cannot pass the HIV virus on to someone else. Without treatment, here goes the more infections for those that are HIV positive, they're most likely to become re-exposed to another virus, someone else's HIV virus, and let alone those that who are not infected with HIV. These dollars also support the PEP program, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it will be a grave impact um, for those infected and affected um, with HIV and other STIs. And you were at the uh, State House rally. I wanted to share a couple clips. This is Gerald James, a senior manager with the Biomedical Intervention Programs at the CRC Community Resource Initiative. He's HIV positive, and here he is at the State House on Thursday. My organization provides um, coverage, medication coverage for people with HIV and also without HIV. In particular, we need medication coverage for those with HIV because there are many people who cannot afford um, their, their coverage, their co-payments, and their deductibles. So we really need to emphasize how important the funding to various agencies, including CRI, is in order for us to provide the coverage for medication services so people can both prevent getting HIV and get treatment if they do have HIV. I've been HIV positive for 42 years. Luckily, I've always worked and had insurance and I've been able to pay for my medication through my insurance plan or on my own. But I'm the anomaly. I am not the standard person. Most people in the Commonwealth cannot afford it and do not have the ability to pay for their medications. And at that rally, you, you talked about the cost of these medications, right? I, he's got insurance and he feels very fortunate to have insurance, but these are expensive treatments and that supplementation is, is necessary to help people, not only, as you mentioned, with uh, people not getting in contact with it, but with the spread and transmission. Absolutely, the medications 
are anywhere from at least $2,000 or more a month. And these dollars would gravely impact someone, including myself, who a long-term survivor, someone living with HIV for over 28 years. Um, what would I do? I, I, I do have a job, but I know I could never afford $2,000 or more a month for medications. I wanted to, so we had reached out to the state um, to get their response. And I'm curious to both of you for to your reaction to their statement. They said um, the administration had to look at creative solutions to balance our budget. Given declining revenues, we worked hard to identify areas to reduce costs without negatively impacting services. In the case of impacted HIV AIDS hepatitis C programs, there are a number of other state programs that can absorb these reductions and no programs will be negatively impacted. And they also mentioned some funding that was put towards these programs run by the state back in 2023, when they say that no programs will be negatively impacted, what is your response to that? I, 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 it's easy for them to say, so where I work at AIDS Project Worcester, we have a syringe services program. These dollars would gravely impact that program alone where people could come and access clean syringes and not that we or other programs across the state are promoting drug use. But we know that there are communities that are still actively using and we want to be able to provide clean syringes and other supplies and treatment opportunities for those who are ready for treatment. Right, and what do you make of this response from the state? Uh, they said this was a creative solution. Um, I think they're absorbing some of it through state programs, but those state programs also serve towards this greater goal that you mentioned needs to be supplemented, right? Yeah, no, you know, anytime we hear about funding cuts for programs that are so critical to keep people alive and also to prevent transmission in the community, we're always very concerned. And again, what I what do I think? When I think about these funding cuts, I think of like specific programs that I personally know that I've worked with that have had a really significant impact in number one, testing people in the community, making sure we're identifying people, supporting people in the community. As I said, you know, the public health workforce that really keeps us going and make sure that we identify cases and LinkedIn care really de depend on these vital uh, resources. So, um, so it is really key and important that, that, that we still have that funding ongoing. I wanted to ask you too about the time that this is happening. Um, there's a recent Boston Globe article that showed that there was an acceleration in an HIV outbreak uh, in Boston in the past year with nearly 60 new cases identified since last March, according to state data. Um, and on a federal level, there was an inquiry in 2018 that showed that since 2015, we've just seen this incredible spike. You know, um, the federal inquiry attributed it to the surge of fentanyl coming into the state, but also homelessness, incarceration. You know, we're getting out sort of co as COVID is easing. I'm wondering what you think of this cut coming and sort of the timing of it, right? As, as all of these factors are lining up. Yeah, no, we're emerging from the pandemic where we know that because access to healthcare has been for like preventive services has been, you know, lowered. And so it is really key that at a time when we have not been able to identify cases that we, we are able to maintain those sources so that we can identify people who have HIV in the community and, put, and provide them with resources. And, I, and you're correct that actually during the um, overdose crisis that we've seen around the country, this has also been associated with an increase in HIV in certain groups, including persons who, who, who inject drugs. And actually, Massachusetts is one of the states that identified one of those outbreaks in 2017. And so that's why it's so key and important that as we're emerging from the pandemic, that we have the resources to test people, to identify new cases and link people to care, and also prevent people who are at risk from getting HIV. So um, it is really important that we maintain uh, all those resources for the community. And in this article, this is Danny McDonald, recent article, um, mentioned that there, people might be re-engaging with testing now as the pandemic eases. And I'm wondering, you know, if that is, in your experience, Carla, something that you have seen where people were more resistant to come to get services during the pandemic or have avoided things like needle exchanges um, during the pandemic and are now returning to that. And if that is also contributing to a higher level or a higher number, right? Because sometimes we'll say, oh, there's a spike and it might just be, be there's more people getting tested. What I would say is that yes, we, we did see a decrease in our numbers with testing 
through the, throughout the pandemic and the onset of the pandemic. But what I am happy to say is that AIDS Project Worcester never closed our doors during the pandemic. And now that we people are coming back and looking to be tested and getting treatment and you know, we are experiencing an increase of people wanting to be tested. And with this funding cut, that would impact individuals who would want to know their HIV status, who needs to get in treatment. Um, this, this would be a health crisis, um, uh, another pandemic to, to decrease the funding. And, and we're asking for just level funding. We're not asking you to add millions and millions more dollars. We would just wanna see level funding from prior years because $5.6 million that is a lot of money and it's gonna impact a lot of areas, different areas across the state as well as marginalized communities. Right, I think that I'm curious too about um, the political aspect of this as well. Like if you have faced kind of pushback because harm reduction is a very political issue and in the fight to secure that funding in the first place, there's always pushback, right? So this loss coming from a budget cut, I'm wondering what your your feeling is about that. So me personally, I take it really personal because I'm going to be impacted. And I, I, I'm also a woman who has been in long-term recovery. And I was one of those individuals out on the streets doing anything um, to get my drug, you know, being um, a derelict in society, if you will. But now I'm on the other side. I wanna give back, I wanna help. I wanna see people get in treatment, get care and, you know, have greater health outcomes. And, you know, the 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 restoration or restoring that 5.6 million, I, I really believe that it needs to be put back on the table. This is not one area that should be even considered with cutting. We're talking about public health. And we know that um, it would be less um, strain on medical professionals in the hospitals when people are not treated because I can see my health declining without medications. I mean, where do we go from here? What do you think is needed right now in this current moment? I think that we need to learn a lot of the, to really learn from the lessons from the pandemic. And one of them is one of the things that I emphasized during this conversation is we need to meet people where they are. We need to stop expecting people to come to us, but meet them where they are. And the programs that, that are being funded by, by these resources that are going to be cut, unfortunately, are the ones that are meeting people where they are. They're providing testing in the community. They're providing a public health workforce that's going to support people so that they can get tested and get linked to care. So I think that, um, really learning from those lessons and, and really using that opportunity to strengthen the, the programs that have actually worked and investing in it and actually growing them is, is, is what would be a helpful next step. Carla, where do you go from here? What's next in this fight for you? I'm gonna continue to knock down doors, raise my voice, be a voice for the voiceless, um, contact our senators, our legislators, and I'm even in the process of, of, you know, we've had our lobby day at the state house, but that's just one day. It doesn't stop there. Um, we want them to know, like, we thank those legislators who are who do support this, um, this, this who do, is not in for this budget cut, but does support the work that is being done in uh, with this line item. And so we're just gonna continue to raise our voice, get the word out, and hopefully our legislators will restore the funding. Great, Carla Norris, uh, Dr. Sabrina Asuma, thank you both so much for being here. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. After many months of repairs to take out slow zones, are T-Riders getting a smoother ride? After several service disruptions, including a derailment and downed wires, the answer depends on who you ask. So with ongoing repairs suspending service on parts of the Orange Line and more work to come across the MBTA, GBH News transportation reporter Bob C. joins me now with what to expect in the weeks to come. Bob, what happened this morning? Well, an unfortunate uh, convergence of events took place. Uh, two Green Line trains became disabled at the same time. 
right during morning rush hour at the same time that the orange line, part of the orange line was shut down for repairs. So all of that happening at once caused big backups. And there was the just an or a green line derailment over the weekend, well, that's right. Once again, you know, the first day that the MBTA restarts service on the green line after 18 days of repairs, we have a derailment. That was due to the car, according to the T, not the rails. So. They're investigating that. And there was also an incident where an orange line, I think, nearly took out some tea workers who were who were working on the rail. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to believe that the tea hasn't quite got a full grasp on this situation, where there are workers working on the tracks, and somehow the train operator doesn't know that they're ahead, and suddenly they have to scurry and hide against the wall as the train goes past. I mean, it's pretty scary. It's something the Federal Transit Administration has cited as being a real problem. And while all of this is happening, and uh, we're also looking ahead in, just into April, there's a ton of shutdowns in April. Um, the Orange Line, Silver Line, Red Line, Blue Line, there's gonna be some, some shutdowns on the Haverhill Line, you know, a couple days yeah. at a time. What does all of this mean? I mean, what is going on? Well, somebody overheard somebody speaking uh, on the red line the other day about the problems that were going on and saying, well, like, why don't they just sh shut down the whole system until they can fix it? That's essentially what's happening in segments. They're actually having to fix the entire system, but they're doing it in segments so that there will be continuing disruption right through this year. We spoke to uh, some MBTA riders last week. Here's, a, here's some clips of that. The evening rush hour, it, there are not enough trains on the D-line for sure, because sometimes, especially when there's a Red Sox game, it's impossible to get on a train. So in the morning, there's um, uh, sometimes hardly any space for even standing. Um, and getting them more often, there was a time when it, uh, during early rush hour and in the evening, um, it would be a, a train every seven minutes. It's still busy, but now it's every 20 minutes in the evening. I took the orange line because I walked from um, Heinz Convention Center because I guess they fixed it. So I had to walk all the way from the Fenway to Back Bay and then jump on the orange line. But they need to improve it. We're in 2024. So it's like every day, is once you get used to that route, right, right. then it changes. changes right. right. And as much as you can publicize what the changes are going forward, people still that first day are not used to it, and there's a lot of confusion. But unfortunately, that's the way it's going to have to be for a while until they can get these tracks fixed and those slow zones removed. And I mean, we are used to red lines on fire and green lines. <laughs> we hear about this stuff all the time, but this does feel like a lot of chaos. It feels like a massive overhaul. Is this just growing pains towards a sleek, futuristic, fast, Ooh, oh. perfectly running <laughs> tea service in the future? Is that what we're moving towards? It's, it's making up for decades of negligence and, and neglect. Uh, in maintaining the system. And so now we're having to go through the painful process of fixing all the things that they didn't take care of for years. And is that, so that's all that it is really, it's growing pains, I hope. Well, it, it, I think eventually as, as we progress, people will gradually see some improvement. There has been improvement on every subway line except the red line since they've begun the work last fall. So there will be gradual improvement, but it's going to take a while for people to really appreciate uh, the, the faster trips. Hmm. And I want to talk to you about uh, Mayor Michelle Wu has been out. Oh, yes. as, as we were talking to commuters, she's been doing this TikTok series, right? right? Commute with me. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, I know she's I, been like, a, yeah. I think it's, well, first, you know, transportation is her big thing. And I remember when she first proposed fair free tea, people were mm -hmm. like, how is this even possible? But she is like, reminds me of Dukakis in a way back in the day, riding the tea and actually bringing to life some of the real everyday problems that commuters face. And I think it's wonderful that she's doing it. Let's watch a clip of uh, Mayor Wu's TikTok commuting with a rider. Good morning. It is 7.45 in Alston, and we are here to commute with Molly to Brigham and Women's Hospital. Hi. Good morning. It's okay. Oh, this, is, this is great. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. We squeezed on. A lot of the bus stops are yeah. just long benches. If, if that, we can get a bench. That's, that's 
that's a good bus stop. That's a bus stop. Mm -hmm. Then you can sit on that bus stop. No shelter, no heat. So she mentions in that clip that her commute would be 45 minutes on the train and also 45 minutes walking. <laughs> right. I mean, I love the transparency, right? Yes. No, I, I like what she is doing, the mayor, in terms of bringing some of these problems to life. I mean, we can talk about them, but when you actually talk to commuters and understand what they have to go through every day, you get a greater appreciation of just how much work has to be done to improve the system. Right. You have to actually be there on yeah. the ground. And all of this doom and gloom and everything crashing and falling apart, um, there is a bit of potentially maybe kind of far away good news with uh, this Fairmount uh, line battery electric trains yeah. that are coming. Electrifying the Fairmount line, which runs through, uh, you know, Roxbury, Mattapan, from Reedville to South Station. And that that's the community. Those communities are the ones who feel the worst effects of diesel you know, exhaust from mm. the trains. So to electrify that line would be a major step forward. We should know in just another month when they open the bids uh, to, for this proposal just how this is going to look probably three to four years in the future before we actually get something running, though. On that timeline, it seems, that seems fast. <laughs> <laughs> seems good. All right, Bob C., thank you so much. Transportation reporter for GBH, thanks for joining us. We'll thank talk you, to you Tilly. soon. Thanks. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow. We'll take a look at microplastics, why they end up in our oceans, our food, and even our bloodstream. A local doctor who's been sounding the alarm about them and the potential dangers for human health will join me. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. I'm Tori Bedford. Good night. Today we're talking about Kino. How do you play it? How do you know it's on the level? And most importantly, is there a secret to winning at it? Kino is a lottery game with roots in ancient China, and at some bars and convenience stores around these parts is also a way of life. I'm a degenerate gambler. I love the spice. I love Kino, and I love to play the Kino for customers. If we go to a bar and Kino. Yeah, they got Kino, Kino for playing it. Want to learn how to play? Let's go. You'll need your supplies, a Kino slip, a pencil, and some cash. First, you decide how many numbers you want to play. This is called a spot game. Playing seven numbers, you are playing a seven spot game. Always a three spot. Three, four tops. Usually a five spot. I just play nine spot. I play 12 numbers. Next, you pick how much you want to bet and how many games you want to play. Three spots, 20 bucks a game, five games. Then you pick your actual numbers from one through 80. Three is my birthday, 19 is hers. I scramble my numbers around all the time. I'm an 11, 25, 57 kind of a guy, you know? My mother's birthday. Finally, you head to the cashier or automated kiosk, pay up, and it's game time. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. Games happen every three to four minutes from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. In each game, 20 numbers are drawn at random. If enough of those numbers are your numbers, you win. I'll take it all in just the one five. Thank you very much. For example, in a four spot game where you wagered a dollar, two correct numbers win you a buck, three right gets you four, 
and all four will win you 100. I got 11 out of 12 numbers, so I won 25,000. Played a little golf this morning, played a little keno. I'm down about $1,200 today, you know? The more numbers you play and the more of them you get right, the more you win. Up to a million dollars for 12 out of 12, which just happened for the first time in Massachusetts lottery history. The player in Pittsfield picked numbers 1 through 12, and they all came up. Wait. 1 through 12 was selected randomly. Randomly? I do believe it's rigged. You can get paranoid sometimes. It's a scam, bro. It's all a scam. The house always wins, you know what I mean? What do you want me to say? We are based on integrity, security and integrity of our games. I met up with Mass Lottery spokesman Christian Tija at the lottery headquarters. If our games are not secure and not on the up and up, then we would be nothing. And Kino is a significant chunk of the lottery's business. Millions of dollars are wagered each day on hundreds of games that play out simultaneously on thousands of screens. There are two computer systems involved in a Kino drawing. The first one is the central gaming system, which essentially runs the game. So all the terminals that you see at retail locations throughout the state, those wagers are processed through a central gaming system. And that is also the system that eventually determines which tickets are winners. The second is the random number generator. The random number generator is constantly picking sets of 20 numbers multiple times per second. And then when it gets the message that the wagering has closed on a specific Kino draw, whatever group of 20 numbers that was selected at that moment, those are the ones that are sent over to the central gaming system. And crucially, the random number generator has no idea what numbers are being played for any given drawing. And with a game like Kino, you can essentially control how much total money players win over time by how you design the payouts. Massachusetts Kino is structured so that about 70% of all of the money that comes in will pay back out to players in the form of winnings, which means... The lottery can get 30% of your money in the long run by being honest. Okay, fine. Is there a way to beat it? Or at the very least, improve your chances of a win? Plenty of folks have a strategy. A lot of people, when they're betting Kino, look for patterns. They make pretty pictures on the bet slip, or they you know, pick all the multiples of seven because that's supposed to be lucky. But at the end of the day, there is a cold, hard certainty in the mathematics of randomness. There is no strategy that will change the chance of winning. All 20 number combinations are equally likely. That said, for folks who are okay with very modest winnings... The pick two game in Massachusetts has the highest chance of winning, in part because Massachusetts pick two pays off even if you only match one number. But it's not gonna make you rich. You can get kind of rich winning a 10, 11, or 12 spot game, but the state has a cap on the total payout. So even if you do somehow get all of the numbers, if enough other people do as well, you might not actually win the full amount. To figure out what other people do and then do something else. For example, if people are picking numbers based on birthdays, and a lot of them do, all their numbers are gonna be one to 31. Forget what they told you in kindergarten. Sharing is not good here. Bowman's favorite strategy when he's at a bar or restaurant that has Kino, he picks his two favorite numbers, six and 28, solely in his mind. And I watch the game and every time those numbers don't come up, I think I've saved a dollar. There's no question.